If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new person, a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. If you have a Bible, John chapter 4. And we're going to read, you know, in the early days of the church, most of the gatherings were the leaders of the church reading the letters to the church from Paul or those who had written them. And that's what they did. They just read the Bible. So today we're just going to read the whole Gospel of John together. No, no, we're not. <laughs> but we're going to read quite a few passages because this is a great and amazing story. John chapter 4, beginning with verse 3. He, speaking of Jesus, left Judea and departed again to Galilee. And he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, being wearied from his journey, sat by the well. It was about the sixth hour, and a woman of Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Disciples had gone away into the city to buy food, and the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where are you going to get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, and who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Well, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. And Jesus said to her, well, go and call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said, well, you've said well, but you've had five. And the one whom you have now is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. And the woman said to her, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is a place where one should worship. And Jesus said to her, woman, Believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, well, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he'll tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And at that point, his disciples came, and they marveled that he talked with a woman. And no one said, what do you seek, or why are you talking with her? The woman left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come and see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this not be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. Lord, we just ask that you would take this amazing story and speak to our hearts this morning about your love, about your life, about your gift of living water. Lord, speak in a way that I can't, speak in a way that only your Spirit can. Give us ears to hear what you would say in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Grab a seat if you would. Jesus is traveling from Judea, southern Israel, and he's headed back to Galilee. That's his headquarters, his 
place of operations. He's he's on foot, and he comes to a certain area known as Samaria. Now, it's a three-day journey back to Galilee from southern Judea on foot, and they've been traveling probably for quite a while, at least I would say probably six hours, because in verse 6 of what we just read, it tells us it was the sixth hour, and in the Jewish time clock, that would be about noon. So they probably got up about 6 a.m. They've been traveling all for six hours on foot. Jesus is tired, it says. He's weary. Six hours of walking, he's, he's ready for a break. And in verse 8 of the passage that we just read, his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food, and Jesus sits down. He sits down by the well. It's been a long morning. And in just a moment, he, he will be involved in a conversation with a woman that I believe is not an accident, not a coincidence that they will both be there at the same time. In fact, in verse 4 of John chapter 4, it says he needed to go through Samaria. If you look down to verse 34, he says to the disciples when they're asking him, why are you here? What are you saying? He says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Jesus came to Samaria to do the Father's will. He needed, he said, to go through, I believe, to meet this woman not a coincidence. He's not just stopping for water or rest. He's come there by the the leading of the Holy Spirit to speak to a woman about her soul, to speak to a woman about her life with the good news about the Messiah. The woman arrives at the well at noon. The well, if you're in Samaria, is about a it's about a half a mile outside the city. She had she had come there. I'm sure for some time, and I'm sure that Jesus saw her coming with her water pot either on her head, which was a traditional way for women to carry, or in her arms, and she's making her way, well, she's making her way to a divine appointment. She doesn't know it, but it's just an ordinary day for her, like any other day, going to draw water. But this is about to be, listen, this is about to be the day of her life. And and I believe, you know, that the Bible gives us an understanding of appointments. Scripture even says, it's appointed unto man once to die. There's an appointment you and I have. We're appointed to, to be born, and in, in, in the Song of Solomon, it talks about, you know, there are seasons, time to be born, a time to die, and, and we generally don't choose our time to be born, right? None of you said, oh, I'd like to be born on, no, you were born, and most of us don't choose our time to die, but there is a time that we do have a part of a choice in, a divine appointment where we can receive life in Christ, where we can receive forgiveness of Savior, we we play a part in that choice. And maybe you're here today, and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Maybe you're a, a prodigal who's drifted away, you hang around the outskirts of the church, so to speak, and maybe today you have a divine appointment with the Lord. You didn't know it. When you showed up, just like the woman at that well, she didn't know it. But the Lord says, wherever two or three gather together, there I am in the midst of them. He's here, and he'd love to meet with you today and offer you what he's offered this woman, living water. And so today, I want you to think about this. At the end of the service, I'm going to offer you an opportunity to respond to the Lord. And I would like for you to just even now just begin to think about and process, well, what am I going to do? Is the Lord speaking to me? This is the day of this woman's life. Socially, it'll change her. Eternally, 
it'll change her. See, she, she's a Samaritan, despised by the Jews. There's this big rift between the Jews and the Samaritans because Samaritans had intermarried, and, and they had actually set up their own place of worship there in Samaria on Mount Gerizim. And so there was this huge rift between the two of who was following the one true God. She was a woman, not esteemed very highly in that day and in that culture. So she's a Samaritan. She's a woman. She's been married five times. Very scandalous for a Mideastern culture, and yet it's even worse than that. She's now forsaken even the idea of marriage and no longer demands commitment of marriage to give what a woman gives to a man in the context of marriage. So she's living with a man in an immoral situation. Uh, and in that culture, because of the heat of the season, women would come to the well early in the morning or late in the evening. That's a normal time. But here she comes at high noon. She makes this half a mile journey in the heat. She wants to fill this jar of water. Uh, socially, she's unwelcome at normal time. She's, she's a rejected person among Samaritans who are already rejected people. She's kind of a double outcast, if you will. And even within her own household, the one person she does have a relationship with, the one person she does have contact with, has made it clear he'll not marry her. She's given herself to five other men already. And I believe she's, she's lost her. She's kind of at the bottom. She's lost her sense of self-esteem. She's lost her sense of worth. The man, I, I assume, is providing for her uh, financially and giving her a home and protection. But in exchange for a marital relationship without marriage, and she's basically a servant of this man in so many ways. She's about as low in the social strata of her community as you can get. And worse than that, listen, worse than that, she knows it. It's one thing to be low in the strata, right? It's another thing to know that you are. And she knows it. That's why she's there at noon. And she knows it. She knows she's ashamed of her past. She's ashamed of the decisions that she's made. She's got this self-imposed isolation going on in her life. And she avoids all those who could remind her of how life could have been and how life should have been. Now, now, please tune in. In spite of all her failures and all the choices that she's made, God the Father is seeking her. He's coming after her. In fact, he sends his only begotten son to meet her at that well that day. Now, if you were to go back and, you know, read through the Gospel of John, it's interesting the chronology that you see in this Gospel. In chapter 3, Jesus encounters another individual at night. It's a man named Nicodemus. And these two people, Nicodemus in chapter 3, and the woman at the well in chapter 4, couldn't be any different if you designed it yourself. He was a Jew and a man. She was a Samaritan and a woman. He was highly educated, highly religious. She most likely was not at all. Women didn't get much education in that day and in that culture. He was very moral. She was very immoral. He was extremely respected and held in high esteem, the teacher of Israel. And she was an outcast. He was wealthy, lived in a great home. She was poor and dependent. He sought Jesus out at night. She had no idea who Jesus was. In fact, she was a little taken back that he would even speak to her. But both of them, contrasted here in the Gospel of John, are equally in need of Christ. And he loves them both and reaches out to them both about their soul and about their salvation. So you can be very religious and lost. And you can be very non-religious and immoral and be lost as well. Some come to the Lord with a religious background. Some people grow up in the church. 
have all kinds of rituals and things they go through, but never, ever experience Jesus Christ. Others come, you know, on a journey like the Samaritan woman. Difficult life, a lot of immorality, regrets, broken relationships, issues. And, and here in our story, Jesus encounters this woman. And he, and, he, and he starts off in verse 7 with just four simple words. Give me a drink. Give me a drink. Basically he's saying this. Grant, bestow to me, would you be kind enough to give me? Now she's not offended, but she is surprised. Everybody knew the rules, the social taboos, the prejudice and the hatred between Jews and Samaritans. And Jesus here has made himself very vulnerable. He's now on the end of being rejected. He's, he's, he's the one that's asking for something. He also, by receiving from her, if she gives it to him, is obligated to her for kindness. So with very four simple words, without manipulation or force, but with great respect and kindness, Jesus builds this bridge for her to respond. And there in verse 9, the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan? Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus said, Well, if you knew... And now he steps into the story in a deeper way. If you knew, boy, if you, if you only knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you ask me, and I would give you living water. Now she's in a conversation with a Jewish man. This is weird and amazing. That fact, she's even in a conversation with anyone. She came out to be there by herself. What she doesn't know is this woman's talking to the Messiah, the Savior. She has no idea. Jesus is offering her living water. Now, living water in that day would, would mean something different to her there than it does to us now because of we know Jesus is living water. But to her, it would mean, well, running water, like a stream, water that is is, is uh, it's, it's fresh, it's, it's pure, it's, it's, it's not uh, like water in a pond or a well, it's like water in a river. That was living water in those days. For us, it might be Perrier, a Pellegrino. I have a Pellegrino with lime. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's fresh water, it's bubbling water, it's, but that's not what Jesus is, is saying to her. He's saying, she thinks he's saying, I can give you water different than this stale, stagnant water in a well. I can give you fresh water, clean water, the best. And he's offering her the best quality of life that she could have here on earth. He said, I'm offering you a drink of something that'll change you, the work of God. And, and are you willing to drink? So this conversation now is, it's in gear, if, if you will. And she responds, and she looks at Jesus, you don't, have a, you don't have a rope, you don't have a jar. She, she says in verse 11, you have nothing to draw with, the well's deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us his well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? See, that well would be about 70 to 100 feet deep. Jesus is sitting there, has nothing to draw with. She's thinking about physical water. Jesus is talking about spiritual water. This is Jacob's well. In Genesis chapter 33, it tells the story of how that becomes Jacob's well. And, and it supplied water now for over hundreds of years. He says, are you, are you greater than Jacob? Jacob gave us a well. All you have, Jesus, is this symbolism and poetic speech. Where are you going to get this? water. Now, Jesus is not offended. He's not upset. He could have said, yeah, I know Jacob. 
I wrestled with him one time. He was a pretty good wrestler. But, but he stays focused. He, he says in verse 13, look what he says. He says, you know, whoever drinks of this water is going to thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. He says, whoever drinks of the water I give will be content, will be satisfied if you drink my water. But this water you'll have to keep drinking and drinking again. If you, if you drink of the water that I give, he says, it'll satisfy that thirst that you have deep inside. He's talking spiritual water. So let me ask you a question. How many of you know anybody that you would say, boy, that person seems fulfilled, content, satisfied? It's almost a foreign concept in our culture. You, you can drink of my water, Jesus says, and be satisfied. a reality that God wants to bring into a human heart. When, when a person is satisfied, and the world and the flesh and the, the enemy comes to tempt, a satisfied person has a fighting chance to say no. That you, you can't get at them as easily. In, in, in verse 13, he, Jesus says, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again in this well. And, and you could write that over almost any physical thing that people try to use to satisfy themselves. And the world offers a lot. I mean, think about it. You could go to your favorite restaurant. Uh, you could have... Surf and turf. I don't care. Whatever it is you like, your favorite restaurant, you have, have, have this meal, you know, steak or mashed potatoes, spare, whatever it might be. Then you get dessert. Hot fudge sundae with nuts, whipped cream, strawberry shortcake, huge slice of velvet cake, chocolate whip, whatever it is. And you just, you eat all of this and at the end of it, you're like, man... I can't eat another bite. In fact, I don't think I'll ever eat again in my whole life. You get home a couple hours later, you've got the refrigerator open. <laughs> Is there any of that ice cream left? Where are those cookies? Food doesn't last. Material possessions. Car gets a couple years old. A couple years ago, it was the greatest thing you ever had. Man, I'll never get another car. Education, travel, sex, sports, power, position. It seems like for a while, but well, then the hunger comes back. It's a constant desire, this, this flesh we live in, this mind, this heart we have, the, that, that desires more and more. And all these things physically in this world just can't seem to provide fulfillment or satisfaction. We, we've been created by God with this heart that's designed and, and, and desires communication and a relationship. And until we have that, something's missing. Some sense of satisfaction or fulfillment, there's always this sense of, you know, there's got to be more, or, or, or why am I not happy, or why do I feel alone? And when we get engaged in that journey with him, something changes. Eyes have come open. See, no matter how wealthy or successful or talented or polished a person may appear, any person who does not have Christ in their life is thirsty. They're thirsty, and they're looking for something. That's why you see all these athletes and movie stars and wealthy people. Oh, I've got six houses. I've got 75 Porsches. I, I, I've, got, I've got to have another show. I've got to have another movie. They never can quite get enough. 
I'm always amazed. I, I, like, I follow tennis a little bit. I used to play a lot. And I saw Djokovic trying to get into the Australian Open just recently, and he hadn't been vaccinated. Well, if you know anything about Australia, boy, they were locked down tight. So he came in and said, well, I've got a medical you know, exemption. They said, good day, mate. <laughs> they put him in quarantine and sent him away. And I think, why would Djokovic need another trophy? The guy's been number one for so long now, and, and yet these guys, they, they want to win again and again. So there's something within us. There's this thirst that can't be quenched. It's just there. Someone said, God has made our hearts restless until they find rest in Jesus Christ. We can't not satisfy a spiritual thirst with a physical substitute. You can't do it. The, the woman searched for satisfaction in relationships with men, at least five of them, now six, and she never found it probably never knew what she was really looking for, was the Lord. In verse 14 in our story, Jesus says, Whoever drinks of the water I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. This relationship Jesus is talking about. For now and all through eternity, is everlasting. She, she, can't, she can't get her head around what's going on, and you can imagine she's there for water, it's a normal day, all of a sudden she's engaged in this mystical conversation with this guy who has no rope, he has no jar, and she's like kind of trying to figure this all out, and she says, sir, okay. Uh, it's kind of like, I, I think she's, she's kind of a bit sarcastic here, a bit humorous. She says, let's put it into this game. It's Okay. Give me the water so I don't have to come here and draw. She's kind of calling his bluff. But Jesus isn't being poetic. He's not being silly. He's very, very, very serious. He's not playing a game. The offer he's making is very real. And so he has a way to end the game too. In the verse 16, after she says, yeah, well, give me the water, Jesus says to her, well, he kind of changes the subject from water to husbands. And Jesus said, well, then go call your husband. She knows he has a no jar, no rope, so she puts him in a situation. Now he's got her in a situation. Well, go get your husband. I'm sure this completely blindsided her. Like someone threw water in her face all of a sudden, like, whoa, he just touched a nerve. She responds very quickly in verse 17, and the woman said, and she uses just four little words, I have no husband. This is not a subject she wants to discuss. She's ashamed of the full story. She stops short. I, I don't have a husband. And Jesus does something here that seems almost cruel, but it's not. He answers her in verse 17 and said, you, you well said I have no husband. I'm sure her mind's just spinning right now. And he, he says, for you've had five husbands. And the one whom you now have is not your husband. And that you spoke truly. Jesus exposes her completely, her past, her sin, her failures. And she acknowledges that it's true. She's the woman who says to her, sir, you got me. I perceive you're a prophet. She acknowledges that it's truth, and, and you, sir, you must be from God. I mean, you can imagine this, this whole scenario is just mind-blowing to her now. She just came for some water. And maybe what he's talking about is not so abstract. Maybe it's not so silly. Only God can know what's going down in my life. And, and this was not an act of cruelty or some kind of flippant thing that Jesus said. In fact, it's, a, it's really an act of love when he says this, because Jesus knows in a couple of minutes that she's going to come to the realization, listen, in a couple of minutes, she's going to come to the realization that Jesus is the Messiah, the one all the world is looking for, 
And he wants to make sure that when she believes, when she trusts in him, she doesn't walk away and think, well, if he really knew me, if he really knew what I have done, who I am and what my past is all about, he would have never stopped and talked to me. He would have never offered me what he just gave me. But Jesus brings out her past so that there would be no doubt in her mind that God knew everything about her and still loved her and came seeking for her. He wants her to know that. Listen, love knows. God knows all about you. He knows your past. He knows your victories. He knows your defeats. He knows your secret sins. He knows the things that you're involved in right now. And when he comes after you, he knows everything about you and still loves you and still wants you and still calls out to you. There's nothing about your past that will ever surprise him or push him away or call him to turn you down uh, or, or walk away. He, he began a relationship with this woman knowing everything about her, and he wants to begin a relationship with you and I, knowing everything that I've done, that you've done, and you cannot scare Jesus away by your past. She has a prophet in her midst. So she decides to ask some very important questions. Look at verse 20. This has been a controversy that's been going on for 450 years between the Jews and the Samaritans. She says, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and the Jews say that in Jerusalem is a place where one ought to worship. Some say she's trying to change the subject. Some say that, well, she brings up a theological question to get, get the focus off herself, or, or she doesn't want to dwell in the past. She's been shaken spiritually, I believe. And I believe she's not trying to change the subject. I think she's trying to figure out the right way to come to God. We believe this. This is how I was brought up, she says. This is, this is the way my family taught, and, and, and for all these years we believed this. And she might be thinking, okay, how, how do I worship God? How, how do I know what's right? Some say this, some say that. I've heard this all my life. There's all kinds of viewpoints and all kinds of theories. And that's a great question. So Jesus answers her question. He doesn't say, hey, let's don't change the subject. Let's deal with you. No, he says, no, no. He goes, hey, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when, when you will neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. Now, now let me have your attention. He says, you've been a Samaritan all your life, all your childhood, all your adult life, but you're involved in a system, a religion, that will never lead you to salvation. And you need to get rid of that path. You need to break away from it, from that system, or, or you'll never know God, you'll, you'll never be saved. She needed to hear that, and, and many people need to hear that today that are caught up in religion or caught up in some kind of New Ageism or that, that, that has nothing to do with truth. I mean, what Jesus says to her is, is, is very significant. The hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Now, now the Jews... Obviously, you know, Jesus came from the Jews. They had the temple in Jerusalem. And they had the truth, but they had drifted so far away from it in their hearts. They didn't have the spirit of the Lord. I mean, a lot of people get caught up in Buddhism and voodoo and New Age and atheism. And they've wandered from the truth. Jesus' voice rises above all religions and all controversies and says, I alone can give you everlasting life. 
not about a temple, not about a place. He says that the time has come no longer will be a localized holy place. And, and it is, it's interesting that Christianity doesn't have a Mecca. Oh, yeah, there's Israel. But I don't have to go to Israel to worship the Lord. I don't have to go to Israel to know Jesus. There's no holy supreme place for Christians. It's not like Mecca. Jesus is saying, now whenever his spirit dwells in a believer's heart, and he's accepted the truth, two or three can gather together, and I'll be right there in the midst. Jesus can be worshipped anywhere, anytime in the world, equally. There's no need for a special place. Here in verse 23. The hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The heart and the mind, the spirit has to be both of those engaged. Judaism, well, they had truth, but their heart had drifted so far. So much so that God would say to the Jews many times, you know, you say one thing with your lips, but your heart is so far from me. The Samaritans, their their religion was not based on truth. They they maybe had lively service there on Mount Gerizim. They were all emotional, but it was based on paganism, their own ideas. They had put something in front of God and said, well, God, this is how I believe. You accept it. And Jesus said, no, you got to have both. You got to have both spirit and truth. And God seeks worship from those who are biblical in their belief and in their lifestyle and in their actions. Both their heart and their mind and their soul come alive and they follow the truth. So she begins to think about true faith and and she, she thinks of the Messiah. And she says to him, Well, in verse 25, I I know that Messiah is coming. He'll straighten all this out when he comes. And so Jesus says to her, I am the Messiah. And it seems like all the lights go on. And she suddenly gets it. And the woman leaves her water pot, verse 28, goes into the city and says, come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And they went out of the city and came to him. She brings the whole city out there to talk to Jesus. Jesus never gets a drink of water. But he got this woman. When you come to Christ, he he will never allow your past to identify you any longer. The Samaritan woman is known in the Bible as the miracle of a changed life, an outcast that became his. And you might be here today and say, well, John, you, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've been through. You, you don't know what I've seen. I'll always be the person that was shaped by my past. Why? Jesus says, Well, Scripture says, if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. You know, I was a high school dropout at 16. If you would have told me, John, one day you'll go to college, one day you'll go to seminary, one day you'll be a pastor of a church, I would have laughed in your face. I said, I don't even go to church. I'm certainly not going to go to college. If you think that Christ can't change you, then then you don't know the the power and the love and the grace of God's purpose for life. He said, if you drink of this water. No past is greater or stronger than the blood of Jesus Christ and his love for you. Just not. He changes lives. Not only can he do it, listen. Listen. Not only can he give you a new start, but he loves to do it. I must go through Samaria. Disciples are like, I'm sure we don't, we don't go through Samaria. And Jesus is like, I do. I don't, I don't, 
I don't, I don't want to associate with that kind of person. I, I do. I, I love the Nicodemuses, Jesus would say. I, I love the Samaritans. Because every person needs to have an opportunity to have living water. Don't ever let the enemy take from you what the Lord has for you. He tried to rob this woman of all that God had intended her to be. You know, the scripture says the enemy comes to rob, steal, and destroy. I certainly saw that in my life. I have so many friends that never came to Christ and who, who, have, who have had tragic endings to their lives. I'm like, wow. See, I, I grew up in the, in the 60s and the 70s. I saw a lot of my friends overdose. So, so I, I want to just, before we go, before we close, I want you to ask yourself this question. Do I know for sure that if I died today, I'd go to heaven? Or am I really in a real vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ? Or am I just a person who comes to church and actually I live a second life and I'm a prodigal? I once knew him kind of, but not now. Jesus said, and I think he says it very well, Behold, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. See, none of us know what tomorrow holds. we got this crazy world we're living in. How many of you know we're living in a crazy world? I had a good friend pass away just the other day. Broke my heart. Pastor, amazing guy. When I got the phone call, I was shocked. I thought, oh my God, never. I called a pastor friend of mine. This guy's younger than me. He's younger than him. His wife is much older than he is. And I said, you know, I never thought that his wife would outlive him. She's 10 years older. And his, you know what his response to me was? I never thought you and I would outlive him. <laughs> I said, yeah, no. But it happens. And, and I would pray that if you're here today, that you would never allow yourself to step into eternity based on some ritualistic, religious beliefs that you have, but a heartfelt, real understanding that I know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Amen? Amen.